Hi guys, and today we're going to cover classification. So we've been working through our traditional NLP style analyses and really have been looking at um, the different sort of classic stuff, right? So named entity recognition, which I had always called chunking. Uh, we looked at <clears throat> part of speech tagging and dependency parsing. All of those are a special type of classification. So most of NLP can be boiled down to classification tasks, some of them more well-defined than others. Now, when you move up from working with those style analyses to building your own classification systems, that's a really important area of text analytics. So we'll have uh, a whole set of lectures on sentiment analysis, but that is often a classification technique <clears throat> or goal that one wants to do is classify documents by their sentiment, are they positive or negative? You could also be interested in classifying documents by any set of categorical systems. So instead of sentiment, you could be looking at theme. What is the topic of this document? You could be looking at, um, you know, if you're trying to classify documents by what help ticket, so what department should this go to based on, on customer feedback, et cetera. So <clears throat> classification is used to group, classify, categorize, pick your favorite noun here or verb. And we're doing that based on the attributes of that document. So other classification systems may be using uh, raw scores, but we're going to use the text in the document as our prediction piece. And that work is especially useful if you have a whole bunch of documents and don't have the time or energy to read them all. So you might use them to determine, <clears throat> for example, if they're appropriate for your literature review or not. All right, so this work is not only for documents, but can be applied to music, images, videos, just anything that you want to classify. Uh, and in data analytics, this sort of machine learning set of rules applies to many, many types of analyses. So we've called the different things that we've done, things like taggers for part of speech, NER or chunkers for named entity recognition, parsers for sentence parsing and dependency parsing, and so all of that is a special form of classification that has a set amount of rules. So for part of speech tagging, you could use the universal part of speech system and have 10 outputs, or you could use the more um, complex Brown or, or CNOLL system to create larger parts of number, like 50 plus parts of speech. For parsers, right, we're breaking it down into noun phrases and verb phrases or noun objects, noun subjects. So there's a lot of, of <clears throat> variation there, but it's a set of defined rules. So everything we've done so far could be considered a classification task with a very defined set of categories that we're interested in. Now we can explore how we can build classifiers more generally and talk about how people do text uh, feature extraction. And you can build any type of system, depending on what you want to classify. So the main goal is to take these data or the documents and figure out how we want to classify it. Right? The classification labels can be whatever we'd like them to be. So we'll work here, we'll do sentiment in two weeks, but also um, we'll look here at um, classifying by topic. And I could perform this classification based on some pre-labeled data, that would be a supervised learning task, or I could base my classification and do it on unlabeled data, which is an unsupervised task. We're mostly gonna focus on supervised learning here, but the rules still apply. One must drink one soda from the proper side. All right, all of the documents still need to have some basic set of cleaning procedures done on them or normalization before using any classification techniques. The type of normalization you use will depend on what type of feature extraction you would like to work with. So what can you classify? 
Well, we could classify individual words so we can work at the word level. That's often used for things like sentiment. Many of our unsupervised sentiment techniques focus on the word level and count the number of positive words versus the number of negative words. That's perfectly acceptable. Part of speech taggers also work at the word level. You could work at the sentence or phrase level. That's how NER works and dependency parsing, well, parsing in general. And so I could classify individual sentences as whatever, right? Positive, negative, a named entity, a, um, a hate speech tweet, for example. So I could work at that phrasal level. Um, tweets tend to fall into the sentence level structure. They might have a couple sentences, but they're a slightly smaller document that may be above the sentence level. We could work at the entire document level. We could work at the paragraph level. And we're gonna use the word document here to mean any type of text, okay? Because what we can do is work at any of these levels. Now, some of the extraction techniques we're going to cover work much better at the phrase and up level, but that does not mean that we could not classify individual words. Okay. So I'm just going to use the word document as kind of a global label for any type of text. So whatever level you want to work at. Okay. Now, for a supervised technique, we might have a predefined set of classes that we want to group our documents into. Those might be things like positive, negative, and neutral for sentiment analysis classification. They might be the type of thematic analysis you're interested in, like sports, fiction, news, academic. But really, it can be any keyword you'd like. So the biggest issue with all of this is that whatever, if you want to use a supervised technique, you do have to have pre-labeled data. And so that may determine the type of classes that you want to, to use. If you're using an unsupervised technique, you might use that to create the labels. So you might not know the labels beforehand. So in other analyses, we might use these documents to help reveal what keywords might be used for classification. That would be your unsupervised task. Something like cluster analysis is really popular for this. Topics modeling. Um, by itself is actually a useful tool for elucidating what's in the text. And we'll cover topics modeling next week or soon in the sentiment section. So just kind of a very classic example of a text-based classifier that every um, good email program has, right? So we have real emails and spam emails. Now we have real text and spam text, and I wish someone would write a good system for this because I'm tired of getting spam text, but either way, that is run through some sort of algorithm um, where one looks for specific keywords and phrases or uses a neural net technique, or I don't have a clue how Microsoft or Google's works, but they work fairly well, um, where they have some sort of underlying classification model that model then spits out an answer. This is a real email or this is a spam email. And it sorts your folders based on that. And so what we're interested in here is figuring out how to build one of these classifiers. So we could start, and if you don't have labeled data, this is often a good place to start um, in the, using an unsupervised technique. That does not require that you have pre-labeled data. Okay. And the focus is more on pattern finding, finding those latent structures that are in the data. And by that, I mean, like, what is in this data? Can I classify this data? Are there patterns to be found that I can use for classification labels? So looking at the, you know, if I want my data patterns to be spam and not spam, what um, do I see in the data that I could use to start to label with those things. And so this often is used as a feature engineering technique to help us find those meaningful patterns. And that's a fancy phrase for just digging around. Okay. I highly recommend topics analysis for this type of thing because it will give you often the strongest, most related words. And words are often a big cue as to what the labels should be 
but I know a lot of folks really like cluster analysis. The other type that you might consider is a factor analysis, which is normally used a lot more in traditional statistics, but could be applied in these scenarios as well. Now, what we're going to do in this lecture is supervised techniques, because we're going to cover unsupervised techniques in the sentiment lecture. So we will cover both of them. Um, but in this set, we're going to do mostly focus on supervised techniques. So a supervised machine learning task requires pre-labeled data where those categories have already been defined and paired with the original text. The features are then extracted to help us predict those categories. And there are several ways to do feature extraction. We're gonna talk about the most popular ones here in this lecture. And it's essentially all boils down personally to fancy regression. So regression, you know, straight, boring, linear, least squares regression, is technically a form of supervised learning because you have some sort of predicted outcome okay, and you have the data you want to predict from. And so what your model tells you is what the predictions are. And you know if your model's any good if your predictions match the actual reality of the world. Okay. But in regular regression, we're often trying to pre pre uh, predict some sort of continuous outcome. Uh, Logistic regression, which is a popular machine learning technique, which makes me laugh every time I hear it as a statistician because it is a popular math <laughs> that is a prediction um, prediction system, uh, is, is the, the alternative. So if I want to classify sentiment as positive and negative, that's a great logistic regression task because that is the point of logistic regression is that it calculates the probability of an outcome rather than the actual value for that outcome. And so classification often turns into, from regression, into these kind of categorical techniques. And so we can use something like logistic regression, naive Bayes is another algorithm that people like, uh, support vector machines, not so much on decision trees, although those are popular, we won't use those that much in this lecture. And now I've run out of ones that I've remembered off the top of my head. <laughs> so, and then we'll also look at some of the neural net systems uh, towards the end of the lecture. So what's the kind of generalized process? I am assuming you have a little bit of background knowledge in this because many of the students who come to this class have taken the machine learning class or people who are maybe watching this have seen a little bit of, you know, towards data sciences, machine learning um, tutorials, but kind of making an assumption you're like right on the edge here. How does this work? Well, first we would define our feature extraction by thinking about what might be predictive of these categories. So I, I rely heavily here on talking about spam or sentiment analysis because they're very easy things to think about. With sentiment analysis, a lot of popular algorithms simply count the number of positive and negative words because we have a fairly good grasp of what words are positive and negative. Okay, there are a lot of databases out there with those words. For spam, we might look at particular phrases that we know are popular in spam emails. We might look at the, the structure of the email, right? Is it a bunch of gibberish text followed by a picture? <laughs> we could look at a bunch of different things, but the main goal would be to figure out what those features might be that are predictive. If you're doing traditional research, you do this all the time. What are the variables you wanna to use to predict your outcome? Okay, it's not any different in a classification task. Okay. We pair that feature extraction with an algorithm. This is the math part, right? That helps us do the prediction. So this is where log, base, uh, sport vector machines, that kind of stuff comes in. And we're gonna use that to take our features and math them onto categories. And they all do them in slightly different ways. And this lecture is going to kind of like very vaguely touch on some of the math behind this, but nothing too crazy. Now, once you pick the algorithm, you will take your labeled data. Remember, you have to have data with labels. So you'll take your labeled data and use that as your training data so that your model learns. Okay? I use this word loosely because, you know, people call this machine learning. I don't know what we're learning, really. We're, we're going to apply math to things and end up with a model. So the model, the machine learning model or classification model 
is the combination of our training data and the algorithm. Take those together, it learns weights of the relationship between features and outcomes. So when you ask it about a new set of features, it will spit out what predicted outcome that should be. And so at this stage, I'm basically tuning or tweaking the parameters of the model. And those are the weights, how much each feature predicts each outcome. Sometimes these are called hyperparameters. And you'll see that term used a lot, but really it's just like, does this feature predict either outcome? No, worthless feature. Does this feature predict the outcome? Yes, first one, great. Here's the weight of how well it predicts. And then after training, so we've built this model, we want to see if our model's any good, right? So you can build models that suck. I have built many models that suck. <laughs> so how do I know which models are good and which models are less good? And so a popular way to do that is accuracy. Can the model predict a new outcome on our testing data? And then there are a couple of other, um, a couple of other ones that are specific uh, to the machine learning literature, but have their roots in um, other literature. So I'll kind of use the terminology and I'll talk about how it relates to statistics and to medicine because these two fields also use this terminology. So we would take a testing set to see how well our model generalizes to new data. This is really important because you can build a model that only works on the data you had, have done this, where it doesn't generalize to new data. You always want your models to generalize to new data. Otherwise, they're not worth what you're designing them for. And after you've completed this sort of development, you can measure performance by uh, applying it to that testing set. So what can we predict? Well, we could predict binary outcomes, two classes, this or that, spam or not. We could do what's called multi-class classification, where we assign each document to only one category. And this might be our positive, negative, and neutral. But when we think about text, especially when you're talking about what is in a text, like a topic or a theme, texts are not one thing normally. Okay. We ramble, myself included, and we talk about different ideas kind of interchangeably. And so multi-label classification may be more appropriate for your type of design or system where we assign documents to one or more labels. And this is kind of like assigning it a set of keywords because it's hard to think sometimes that especially larger texts are only one thing, right? And so there's this long standing joke that you don't talk about, um, about you know, politics, right? So sports and politics don't mix, right? But they do. And when people talk about one, they often talk about the other. <laughs> and so it's kind of this system where we can, we can capture the fact that there's more than one theme or more than one thing going on in this text. So I stole this, I think from the NLTK book um, or somewhere online. It is just to me, one of the greatest pictures that they've put together because it really highlights one, how complex a model is in these and the sort of system that one uses. So the top part here explains the training where we have some sort of training classes. This is for supervised learning. So we have the outcomes that we're trying to predict and we have the training documents. And I have one reason I really love it is because they have a big box here for text normalization. You must do processing of your text. No text is just automatically clean, okay? Even if that is something as simple as limitization or removing stop words. You're gonna do some sort of feature extraction. This could be anything that you could do with text. You could count the number of characters. You could count the number of the letter A. Don't know how useful that would be, but you could. You could count the number of words. You could count the number of phrases. You could create what's called a bag of words model, which we're gonna do here in a few minutes. You could count the number of times someone used the word cheese. There are many ways to transform a document into numbers. And this is where you can really go ham. So you can start to um, build your, your models and change the feature extraction. So one thing I like about this area outside of statistics is that like most, a lot of data analytics is try it till it works. Right? And in statistics, that's a no-no. <laughs> 
So I like, I like this stuff because I can just sit there and go, well, that didn't work. Let's try this thing. That didn't work either. Let's try this other thing. Well, that seems to work. Okay. And then from there, as a good statistician and a good experimentalist, I try to see if I can keep making it work, right? Use that as my next hypothesis. Right, so with that feature extraction, we end up with training features, which is a matrix of documents by features, because we're trying to classify by document. And we combine that with our machine learning algorithm. So we take the feature extractions and the, the math, and we create a model. From that model, we feed it the testing documents that go through the exact same normalization and feature extraction procedure. So this is really important. They're the same. You don't change in the middle here. Put that into the model and the model goes beep, 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 beep. Here's what I predict. And then our performance evaluation matches what you predicted to reality and see how well you did. Okay. But notice that we're not predicting the data we already looked at, we're predicting new data. So you shouldn't build a model and predict it on the same, build a model and test it on the same data. And this is one area I think statistics kind of loses out is that that's not as, um, as normal to have a model building and then a model testing stage, because normally we're just examining if we can even build a model at all. <laughs> so uh, this is kind of a, a nice complement where we are building models and testing them. All right, so let's try it. Here's everything we're going to use. So we're going to do this mostly in Python. So NumPy, matplotlib, ignore the, all this nonsense because my matplot does not like my Windows machine. Uh, pandas, beautiful soup. We're going to stem the documents uh, using Porter Stimmer and NLCK. We're going to remove the stop words. We're going to make sure it doesn't have any funky symbols. And we're going to expand our contractions. If all of this is gibberish to you, you should go back and watch that raw speech, processing raw speech lecture, because this is part of the text normalization procedure we're going to use. So <clears throat> there is a famous data set called 20 news groups that has 20 news groups in it. Mm, right. And so we're going to see if we can predict those 20 news groups. So I wanted to pick a, a topic that would be hard because predicting two categories is a little bit easier. Chance is 50-50, it's coin flip, right? Predicting 20 categories is a little bit harder because you need to find enough distinct features to accurately predict each one. Um, so I will say that unless these are very separate things, this kind of task can be harder with more classification labels. Okay. So let's clean out the formatting, take out the empty posts, and do our other text processing that we discussed way earlier in the semester. And so we can kind of see here, um, the 20 news groups is like the earlier form of Reddit. So for my, for my current peeps, you can think about this as each Reddit area, right? Each, each Reddit forum is the word I'm looking for. And those have topics. So we're trying to distinguish between hockey and IBM computers and politics. <laughs> So um, they have some like kind of global themes. There's kind of like sports, computers, and religion. And then they have separations between those as well. We're gonna try to predict all 20, see what happens. But I can already see that I need to do some data cleaning here, right? So there's a little bit of kind of messy data going on. And let's walk through how we might do that. Let's make the text bigger, there we go. So I'm gonna do this in two different ways, this lecture versus the sentiment lecture. So we could write ourselves a little function to do this, or we could run this line by line. Doesn't really matter. So our data has been imported as a pandas data frame, and the text information is in the column called article. Okay. First thing we're gonna do is clean that up and remove any HTML or other weird online formatting using beautiful soup. So to convert this back into the right kind of pandas type of thing, we're gonna make it a list. Within that, we've written a loop. Give me the beautiful soup, get text, for every text in my pandas data frame. Okay, so for every text in my articles column, 
and it helps if you convert that to a list. So pandas, data frame, columns are similar as a series. So we're just converting them to a regular raw list. So for each one, each cell, boop, 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 give me beautiful soup. Now this little, little bitty thing right here is fairly key. You will get errors often if you don't include something like this or pre-normalize. Because if a, um, a cell only has numbers, unlike R, pandas will interpret as we're going um, that as a number, or at least beautiful soup will. And then it'll go, because it doesn't like that. So we're in each case, we're going to make sure we coerce our data into a string so that we are sure that we're processing this as a string and some of these functions don't try to run these as numbers because then it'll get mad. Then we're in a lowercase. Lowercase is a function that we can do um, automatically on a panda series. So we take the column dot string. So I'm coercing it. Dang it, it's a string, even if it's a number, and lowercase that string. By doing this dot function, dot function, it's actually like running apply in R multiple times. So that will lowercase it. Now we could use a couple, there's a couple different forms of contractions. I've got the two different options here. I think this first one's probably a little bit more condensed. It's not two lines. It's not a weird loop. It's the same type of loop, uh, but contractions.fix is actually a good system too but you can use the, the longer one here. So for each contraction in this expansion, um, loop over the data frame and replace. Okay. So we could use contractions.fix for every single column or every single row in our column. Or we can say, um, take that, that column of data, make it a string and replace. Now replace is a great function because it takes the first argument as find this and the second argument is replace it with that. Okay, it's our regular expression option. And so we're find the contraction, replace with the expansion. I have not seen a speed difference between the two. This one only loops once. This one loops every single time over the set. So for each uh, contraction, it loops through the whole data frame. So if you have 30 contractions, it actually loops 30 times. But this is uh, the regular expression replacement thing is fairly efficient. So I haven't really seen a difference in times here, uh, but I do think this first one is probably a bit more processing wise efficient because it only loops once through everything. Now internally, I think it does loop multiple times, but practically, uh, it technically only loops through each one once. Okay. All right, and the next thing we're gonna do is for each of our pieces of information, our text and our data frame. So notice that this part's the same on each one. We're gonna just use this giant uh, normalization piece here where we convert the, the text to ASCII and decode it into UTF-8. This is the system I would use for English, but other data sets and other languages may have a slightly different system, but UTF-8 is always a good encoding because it can handle all these different characters. Then we're gonna take out the special characters. So this just allows us to take out anything super weird, um, slashes, right? So if it starts with A to Z, um, big A to Z, zero to nine. And then this kind of says, if it's a weird character, right? And so if you Google, take out weird characters, take out non-alphanumeric characters, this is what you'll usually find is it basically um, takes out any of these weird symbols. Okay, not symbols, but like um, the, 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 like the things above the numbers on your keyboard. We're also gonna stem. So again, this is the same over here on the end, convert it to a list, and then we're gonna stem that bad boy. So for each piece of text, right? So for each one of our text documents, it then loops over that and stems the words. 
but the stimmers require that you already have that you give it tokenized list. So this piece here just um, runs over each word token. I've used token text.split here, and I'm splitting on just an, a blank space because this is English. You could use something like um, NLTK.word tokenize and um, split the text first, but we're going to stem each word using our porter stimmer, porter stimmer, stem the words, loop over them, and then join them back together. So what happens here internally, the first thing that happens is the text gets split okay, into each token. For each token, it stems the words. Okay, that's what's happening here. Then all of those are put back together into one big text. And you want to make sure you do that part because otherwise you're going to end up with a data frame that has like a list of lists in it. And that makes it harder to work with. So we're going to join that text back together. We broke it apart. We stemmed it. We put it back together okay. for each text in our data frame. So that's stemming for you. Now in R, the stimming is a little better because it doesn't require this tokenization system, but um, in Python, you do have to give it the raw word tokens. We're gonna remove our stop words. And that is basically, we could do replace, I guess. Here's a list of stop words replaced with a space. That would work pretty well, actually. Um, but you could also use this. For each word in my split up text, give me the word back. If it's not in my stop words list, we've used this before. So I want each word for every word in my text, as long as it's not a stop word. Okay. Now I could join these two together so that I'm not splitting, putting together, splitting, putting together, but I have not seen any like time detriment here. Um, so we could actually combine these, but I've separated them out so that each step or each procedure is a different line of code so that if you don't want to do one of these steps, you just turn it off, right? So if you don't want to stem, you just comment that line out. Now, after we've done all of that, we might end up with a cell of data that is totally empty. We have removed all of the words from it, which can happen if the text is very short. So this piece here, basically will help us eliminate any empty cells because many of the functions we're gonna talk about later in this section for feature extraction will blow up your analysis if the cell is empty. And by empty, I mean it has no characters in it, minus spaces. So sometimes what you'll end up with once you remove everything is just a set of spaces or tabs or something. And so um, those don't have any tokenization quality to them. And so they will blow up an analysis, but they don't appear empty. They're not to pandas, they don't appear null or in a. So we have to um, remove things that are technically empty. There's only spaces in them. And so what you do is you say, okay, data df dot article is another way to call that column. Although I could do it like, uh, like this up here, okay, dot String, make it a string, damn it. Dot strip, okay? Strip takes out all those weird spaces. Okay. And now I'm saying if, this is a, a question, if my stripped data equals an empty, an empty cell, okay? Because that's another thing that I think a lot of people don't think about unless you've done some, some PHP coding or some SQL, um, is that cells can be null, Right? They can be totally empty. There's nothing in them. They could be in A if you're thinking about R, okay? which is slightly different than null. Um, or they can be, they can have something in it, but that something is a nothing. Okay? And by that, I mean, they, they marked it as a character column. It doesn't treat it as empty or null, but it doesn't have any, literally has no characters in it. Okay? It is empty. So that is no, there's no space between those quotes. They're just two quotes next to each other. Okay, and this can happen. And so we have to make sure we account for that fact. And so it basically says drop all the rows that want to strip out all the text are empty. Okay. Now we also have to deal with literal nulls or literal NAs that are coded as NAs. So we do data.df.drop 
in A. So that hopefully is clear, it drops in A's. Uh, reset index just means that it, it renumbers the columns for you. Now I ran this, I actually told this not to run so the slides would run. It isn't fast, but it isn't slow either. So um, I just, to save time, wrote that data out and then we'll re-import it here in a minute. So let's look at what that normalization did. And this is what it looks like now. One bad thing about stimming is that it makes the text pretty unreadable, right? We've eliminated all the stop words that would help you fill in the gaps here. And now the words are stemmed and so they're pretty, it's pretty unreadable, but that's okay. Cause I don't need to read it. That's what the computer's gonna do. So on that note, let's try building some models. First thing I'm gonna do is split my data into a training and testing split. In this example, we're gonna do 80 to 20%, but there are other percentages that people pick. Some people do 90, 10%. But you always want to bias where more of the data is in training and less of the data is in testing because you want your model to see as many examples as possible to build the most accurate generalizable model. To do that, I'm going to use scikit-learn's uh, train test split because it's a great function. What you do is um, on the left side of the equal sign, you put in what you want to call your two corpora and then your two naming sets. So we want train corpus, test corpus, train names, test names. Okay. This function will spit out um, wow, four different pieces. <laughs> Brain far there. And this is gonna look crazy. So the first thing that you put in is the text or whatever you're wanting to split. In our case, it's the text, but the, the feature, the features, okay, all of them, not just the the, like if you have your data already broken up, all of the features here. Uh, and so we have data df.article, apply lambda x np dot string. This just converts it into a string still in NumPy's formatting. And so there's a lot of conversions back and forth, which I find fairly annoying, but um, it allows us to, to do what we're gonna do next. So we're taking this and making it a NumPy array set of a pandas data frame. And to make sure that everything still goes in as a string, we're saying apply numpy string function to this so that we have an array, a set of columns and rows that are treated as strings. So you put in whatever your features are first. The second thing you put into this argument is the classification labels. I know those are all strings. If you weren't sure if they were strings or not, or if you use numbers for heaven, he heavens help you, one, two, three, four, you should do it this way again. Everything here at the moment needs to be a string. NumPy array, there you go. Now test size is how big you want your test size to be at a 20%. Random state, this is, you can't go a day without a good Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy joke. So we're going to make it 42. Okay. So let's see what that leaves us with. We have 14,000 or 15,000 ish um, tra tra training data points and 3,700 testing data points. Now, the first thing you should do in all of these, and this is how I teach my logistic regression courses for statistics too is you should check to make sure that there's data in every category. So if you are expecting 10 categories and you have data for four, you can't predict those other categories. They don't exist in your data set. There's no examples to learn from. So we wanna make sure we don't have any empty or very small categories because it is nearly impossible to predict small categories unless you have very, very clean splits in your data uh, a model will always bias towards where there's more information and it will make it easier to predict the larger category. So like in, for example, in logistic regression, if I have a hundred data points and 90 of them are in one group and 10 of them are in another group, my model will be very accurate, 90%, by predicting everything into the larger group. And the model will look great, it looks predictive, but the smaller group is, is nothing in it. 
So let's check. We're going to use the counter library. And um, <clears throat> this whole thing, you could literally just tell it to count. <laughs> but what this does is it makes a nice pretty table and says, OK, take the uh, count the training data, count the testing data, because you need to look in both data sets, convert those to a dictionary. Why make them a dictionary? Because then you can throw it into pandas better. Okay. You could just tell it to spit out counter here, counter there, just look at both of them. But if you have them both as dictionaries, you can use that to convert this into a pandas data frame. So we say, okay, for each key, that's each category, how many are in that category for the training data? How many are in that category for the testing data for every key in the training data? Okay. So if there's some information in the training data, like let's say that the, the testing data has 15 categories and the training data only has 14, it will ignore that 15th category in the testing data. <laughs> so you gotta be careful here to make sure your training and testing have the same number of labels, which they should if you do a random split. And this here just gives it the column information. So the first column is the label, second column count, third column is count. And we're just going to tell it to sort by the counts. So we can tell what categories we have the most information for all the way down to the least. Now, you could just spit, this out, spit these two tables out. That's fine too. So let's see, what do I got here? I have um, a fairly nice split. There's more data in the Christian religion than the religious MISC, but that might be because of the base rates of the number of people posting in each one of these groups. And then uh, on my test count, I have a really pretty nice split here. So we don't see any very small categories, like 10 and under, okay. Uh, and we see that we have a pretty wide, a pretty good, representation of each category in the training data and the testing data. And that's what we want to see. Now, most of these data sets to be good need to be quite large. So generally, this check works OK, especially if you use a random split function, because that should randomly put you know, a fairly equivalent number based on their base rates. right? Um, but this would help show you if a specific category label is very infrequent already. And in that scenario, I suggest either collecting more data or combining it with another label that's very similar. Okay. So here in this example, if we only had a few religious ones, I would just make all the religious ones come together. Now, on to feature extraction. So we're only going to get part of the way through this because we have broken this into two weeks of lecture. So let's just talk about some general feature extraction rules before we get into this. So what are features? Well, in any task, any classification task, regression or not, they are something that is measurable. You can put a number to it. So text here, we're going to convert text into numbers. And many of my qualitative friends are cringing because that's cheating, but we're going to cheat. So generally, these are things that can be counted or coded um, it's either present or not. Here's the number of times something happened. Here's the proportion of times something happens. There's a bunch of ways to think about this. And we just have to figure out how to transform this text into a global set of features. Thankfully, lots of people have done lots of work on this. And so there are some common procedures that work really well. So we're going to mostly spend our time focusing on what's called the bag of words method, because it has never led me wrong. It is a great system that has its flaws, but works pretty well at predicting stuff. Okay. So what is the bag of words method? What you do is you create a table. Okay. That table generally has columns for documents, but it doesn't really matter for this scenario. It has some sort of representation, each vector for a document. I like to think about it as columns. So each column represents a document. Each row represents a piece of vocabulary. Vocabulary might be words, it might be letters, it might be characters. We're talking about Chinese here, for example, since characters don't always represent words. Um, it might be phrases. You could work with bigrams, trigrams, entire sentences, whatever. Okay. So each row represents some piece of vocabulary. Okay. 
we're going to define vocabulary at the word level because that's generally what people do. It's called bag of words for a reason, but you don't have to. It could be bag of sentences. Right. Now, in the table, so we've got words by documents. In the table, what does each cell represent? That could be coded in several different ways. The most common way is simply a frequency count. Here is the number of times the word cheese appeared in document one. Here's the number of times the word pizza appeared in document one. Yum, yum, right? Here's the number of times cheese occurred in document seven. So it's literally, this is what I love about this. It's so great. It is literally a conditional frequency table of words by documents. So much of language can be explained by the words that we use in documents. Duh. If you want to classify things as positive and negative, well, how many positive words are there? How many negative words are there? Same concept. Okay. If you want to classify which one's a sports document, we need to look for the sports words. And this will tell you which one has more sports words than that one. So much of language can just be boiled down to this. Sometimes people use what's called a one-hot encoding, where you just simply say, is it present or not? I don't love one-hot encodings um, because you're losing information. That's like doing a median split, right? So we want to keep the information we have. So counting the number of objects has gives me more information rather than yes, no's. Many cells are a yes, no, but that's because they only appear once. Now, you could also do what's called the bag of engrams method. Everybody still calls this bag of words, but instead of, of using single words, we could use phrases or engrams. There is a problem with that, okay? because by moving from words to phrases, the cell count frequencies get smaller because you know words are more common when we're just counting them, then phrases become more complex and they occur less often. And so you have to be uh, careful with these with a bag of words system that uses phrases because of what's called sparsity. Okay? Bag of words methods do suffer from sparsity problems where many of the cells are zero. And so if you have many documents, your vocabulary gets really long. You have a lot of words, right? And so many of the cells will be zero. And that makes it sparse because many of the cells are technically empty or zero. And then the other cells are all small. One, two, five, seven, 12, okay? Um, we can work well with sparse matrices, but by moving from individual words to phrases, you make it more sparse, which makes it even harder to predict from, predict to, from, to, either way, makes it harder. Okay. What some have suggested you do is a normalization technique. So this isn't really a method. People describe this as the method, but it's technically bag of words with this normalization applied to it, but it's very popular as a method. So I'm gonna call it a method, even though it's technically not. And so it is the bag of words technique, whichever version you like, with a normalization applied on top. Okay. And that's very similar to other techniques like uh, vector space models, like LSA and topics, those have a normalization set of math applied to them. Okay. So TFIDF stands for term frequency inverse document frequency. This is a weighting technique that takes your bag of words method, metric model data frame, and converts those from counts to weights. And what it does is it kind of calculates like how frequent is this word across all documents? and how many words are in this document. And that's how important this word is to this document. Okay. That's really useful because it helps normalize a, a data frame. So words that are very frequent across many documents are lessened in importance because they're not distinct. Right? And words that are particularly salient or important, so they only occur in certain types of documents are weighted as higher because they're more separable. So we want words that help us separate categories easily. And so this normalization or sort of weighting technique really helps us distinguish between words that are just so frequent, they don't tell us anything about the text versus words that are very salient and tell us something interesting about that text or multiple texts. 
And so it's a weighting scheme that can be applied to bag of words and other methods, but it's most popularly applied to bag of words. You do have to be careful here because there are different forms of TF-IDF mathematically. <clears throat> this is something I find amusing to go look at once a year when I teach this lecture. <laughs> that scikit-learn uses like one of the most, arguably one of the most popular machine learning packages in existence, uses a formula that many don't believe is good. <laughs> so there's this huge like either GitHub or, or kind of um, discussion board arguing over this formula. Um, I think it works fine. We're gonna use Gensum. Gensum uses the more traditional mathematical form of this. I think for many people's purposes, that is just a nerd argument, <laughs> but it is kind of amusing that literally the most popular package uses the um, a version of the formula many believe is, is not right. <laughs> so FYI, <laughs> keep that in mind. They, I, I don't think they've changed it yet. <clears throat> All right, some other things that we could do as our feature extractors include uh, some newer models called, one, one of the most popular ones is word to vec word to vec was developed originally by Google. There's a version of this called Fast Text that is Facebook's version. And then there are variants of uh, both of those. It is a simple neural net model. So one layer of hidden stuff in the middle um, versus deep learning, which obviously has many hidden layers. But this one is a simple neural net model with inputs, one hidden layer and outputs. And the important thing about word to vec over bag of words is context. And I cannot highlight this enough. The biggest criticism of bag of words, even though I've told you it's lovely and it does wonderful things, is that it ignores context, local context. Bag of words tends to grab global context. So these words occurring in the same document, so they're probably about the same thing. And so you can maybe figure out context from the list of words. However, sarcasm, irony, jokes, humor, all lost and shades of meaning. So there are many words with many meanings. We've talked about polysemy all year. And local context is what disambiguates those sorts of moments, right? Knowing what words were literally next to each other. And I have found the bag of words will get me 98% of the way most of the time. So it, global context seems to be okay. But if you want to grab more information about the local context, a uh, sorry, word to vec model does encode local context. Okay? And it uses either one of two algorithms, usually. There's different forms of these as well, but they're generally grouped into what's called a SIBO model or a continuous bag of words or a skip gram model. I don't know that I think the distinction is super important for our purposes, but I do think it's important to know that you can try both of them, see which one works better. So a SIBO model um, imply, uh, grabs context by looking at a size window. Let's see, looking at five words at a time. It uses all five of those to then predict the outcome. So it's encoded based on those five and then the next five and then the next five. A skip gram model still takes that five word window, but encodes a direct relationship between each word and the outcome. And so there, there's a difference there. SIBO model is kind of an average. Here's those five words and those five words together on average predict this outcome. A skipgram model instead says, well, these are the five words and they're tied together, but each one individually gets a weight predicting the outcome. Those are slightly different things. Uh, and then before my screen just freaked out, GLOVE is also a popular encoding procedure and fast text, which are similar um, to word to vec They're like tweaks on word to vec to make them uh, slightly different. Okay. I would say fast text is gaining more and more popularity over word to vec but they're very, the differences there are very subtle. All right, so that's all of feature extraction, just some basic concepts before we get into um, how to do those. Let's talk about some, some algorithms that people like. So we could use, I'm gonna mostly talk about multinomial procedures here because um, if it does multinomial, it can do two. <laughs> so a multinomial naive Bayes system, we could look at logistic regression, predicting multiple categories or support vector machines. And we're gonna do all three of these. And so when we get to doing the, them for the first time, I'm gonna give you a very brief overview of how each one works. 
like very brief <laughs> kind of basic concept of the, mat the mathematical background and what those differences are between them. Practically, I would tell you to try them all and see which one works best because there is sometimes fairly good differences between the combination of the feature extraction and the, the algorithm. And so sometimes there is a best combo of the two together. It's not always clear which one it's gonna be. So I hate, I, I dislike, don't hate, <laughs> dislike with students, well, which one's best? I'm like, I don't know, try them all, see what happens. Because I have found that I don't have a good feeling based on the text, which one's gonna work best. Some texts work better with logistic regression and a word to vec model, and some texts work better with multinomial vase and a bag of words model. I don't have one that works the best all the time. Uh, some other ones, random forest, gradient boosting machines, we won't go over, but those are options as well. And these kind of fill in the five most popular algorithms that are not neural net models. And so you can learn a lot more about them using some Taurus data science articles here that talk about the top 10 machine learning algorithms. I would say pick your favorite three <laughs> that, that tend to work um, or becoming human AI. Now to round this out of our picture, remember our picture here, how do we determine what's best? So we built the model and I've built 10 of them, for example. How do I pick which one is the best model? Well, accuracy seems like the most obvious answer. Does your model predict new data? And how well does it predict? So this is literally like, how, what the score does it get on the test? Is it 80%, 90%, 70 70%? And one thing with accuracy you always have to think about is chance. So a model with 20 outcomes has a one in 20 chance of getting it right. So if I got 35% accuracy, I am doing better than chance. I'm not doing that great, but I'm doing better than chance. Okay. So you always have to remember what chance is. Because if I have two outcomes and I get 35% accuracy, you're doing worse than chance, which is a, a lot of weird. Okay. So always remember what is chance when thinking about accuracy. A lot of people have these numbers, these magic numbers. You should get 95% right. And I just don't think that that, um, having some cutoff score the, requires that there are other people who've worked in this field with similar text and similar prediction algorithms. So when I was talking about parts of speech, I said, you need to hit like 90% or you're not doing very well because other models can do that. If you're doing something new for your business, you may never hit 90%. People are weird, it's hard to predict sometimes, right? Um, people are weird, therefore texts are weird because people write the text. Um, so there's no magic accuracy number one should reach. It should be comparable to what other people are doing in the same field using the same type of thing. Okay, that's really key. Don't compare work on sentiment analysis to work on topic labeling. Those are different things. The other two pieces we're gonna talk about are precision and recall, and you could average precision and recall together to get one score called the F1 score. So let's talk about those for a minute. And the easiest way to talk about them is to talk about a confusion matrix. So a confusion matrix is a great way to examine categorical predictions of this versus everything else. So a uh, confusion matrix works for each category label one at a time. And it compares that label to all the other labels. Okay. You can also build like a matrix of every label to every other label, but we're gonna, for precision and accuracy and recall explanation, we're gonna look at each label one at a time. Because if your model, I'm very passionate about this point, if your model does not predict one of the categories, it cannot be a good model. Why is that category there? You never predicted it. And so I've had assignments in the past that overall accuracy was good, but the model never predicted the second category because the, the sample size was small. And I would have students be like, it's a great model. I'm like, but you can't get the other category right. So we need to look at each prediction label or prediction class one at a time to really assess where your model works and where it doesn't work. It's not just like accuracy overall and I'm done. So confusion matrix gives me the predicted label versus the act active label. So what are the times that I predicted this category versus not predicting this category? 
And it's a great way to see where the model is getting things right and wrong. It will also help us explain what precision and recall are. So this is a great little table. Okay. So we're going to compare our predictive value over here, over here, to our actual value, okay, as confirmed by the experiment. So these are the predicted labels versus the actual class labels. A true positive is a value that you got right. So you guessed it was cheese and it was cheese. Good job. Yes. A false positive is when you guessed that it um, was cheese and it was actually one of the other 16 things. And that's not good because you guessed it was one thing, it's actually another. A false negative is where you, um, it's a miss. You guessed that it was bread and it was actually cheese. So you missed it. And the last one is also where you get it right, it's sometimes called a correct rejection, where that you guessed it was bread and it was actually bread, so it's not cheese. Okay, so I guessed it was not cheese and it was actually not cheese, it was bread, so I got it right. And so these are collapsed across all of the other categories. So essentially it's, it was, I guess cheese and it was cheese. I guess cheese and whoops, it was something else. I guessed not cheese and it was not cheese. I, uh, sorry, I guessed not cheese and it was, so I missed it. And I guessed not cheese and it isn't cheese. Okay. So it's broken down into this sort of binary system, even if we're using a, a more uh, like 200 labels. This is very similar to statistics. This is how hypothesis testing works. So a true positive is that I rejected the null and I was supposed to reject the null. A false positive is sometimes called a type one error where I rejected the null and I wasn't supposed to. A false negative is when I missed it or type two error where I rejected the null and I shouldn't have. Or I failed to reject the null and I should have rejected, I missed it. It was there and I missed it. Uh, true negatives don't have names. True positives sometimes called power. Okay. This is also very similar to the medical field where they talk about sensitivity and specificity. So I um, correctly identified that the disease was there. So if we want to talk about COVID, even though we're probably all over it at this point, but I said that you had COVID and you did, right? It's a true positive. A false positive was I said I, you had COVID and you didn't. <laughs> um, and so these are often calculated in the medical field as tests that are sensitive and specific, which is what you want, right? Um, but we're going to focus here. So I wanted to relate this to other things that exist in the world because they're um, pretty popular, is uh, precision and recall, which are machine learning labels. But it's very similar to hypothesis testing and statistics and the medical field's sensitivity and specificity analysis. Okay. So I want to just like lay these all out on the screen because we're going to pause the video after this point for next week's lecture and then get into like how, how these are actually calculated mathematically. Um, and then we'll talk, we'll work on applying all of these concepts to actual data. <laughs> so we'll get through the 20 news groups prediction. So a true positive, just to spell this out, if you didn't understand the picture is when a target category is indicated and it actually is that target category. A false positive is when you say it's that target category of cheese and it is not something, it's something else. It could be any one of your other options. And true negative is when you said um, the target category is not indicated and it's not. So we got it right, a cor correct rejection. A false negative is when you say, nah, it's not this thing and it was, you missed it. A lot of these can also be related to battleship. <laughs> so it is a hit. You got it right when you should have a miss, you missed it and you should have hit, you should have had a hit. Uh, cor correct rejection is when you missed, you said it was a miss and it was. Okay. So all of these can be used to classify, to calculate what's called precision and recall. We're gonna pause the videos here though, because otherwise it just gets way too, way too damn long. <laughs> and we're gonna pick this up. What is precision and recall and how does that help me in our next set of lectures for next week? and then we'll apply those to a data set.